Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Andy Mant on Instagram, I am Andy Mant is the founder and CEO of Blue Blocks, a company specializing in evidence-based advanced light filtering eyewear. He has a passion for researching and educating to help empower others to lead an optimal and fulfilling life. I've got a couple pairs of Blue Blocks myself and, and really enjoy them and, and use them at night when I'm watching TV or Netflix with my wife or um, if we're out to dinner or anything like that. And Andy started Blue Blocks after becoming dissatisfied with the quality and standards of blue light blocking glasses available, so he set about to design lenses that match the evidence in the academic literature. Andy ha- happened upon blue light and circadian rhythms after a history in uh, ketogenic dieting and well-being and, and a health journey, which we're going to hear a little bit more about today. Um, but now he's a leading figure in managing light to improve health and well-being. So welcome to the show, Andy. Very excited to have you. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure, Scott, to be, uh, to be talking with you. Um, you know, a couple of the originals from the uh, ketogenic dieting days you know all those years ago so um, it's good to be able to connect and talk about uh, something a little bit different today yeah absolutely and um i i mentioned before we started recording i first happened upon your work uh several years ago when it was you and ted Naiman and marty kendall um and maybe some of the keto gains guys too talking about um you know protein leveraging and and um nutrient density and some of those topics and really enjoyed your content back then. Um, so I, I'd love to hear, you know, how did you first become interested in circadian rhythms and maybe tell us a little bit more of your personal story and journey as well? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm still uh, still in contact with all those guys. Um, you know, like I think Sean Baker's pretty big in, in your community as well. And I remember when he was first starting out and everyone was thinking like, wow, this guy only eats meat. This is insane. And and now look at the, uh, um, you know, the, the the community that's that's grown from that. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and Marty Kendall, another Another fellow Aussie um, over on the East Coast is is doing marvelous things with with nutrient density. So those were the those were the guys that really got me into thinking critically. It was you know, I moved to Australia maybe sort of around about this time in 2011, and it wasn't until about sort of 2013 2014 um, my weight just ballooned. Um, I lost all sort of um, you know, fitness that I had in my twenties when I was playing a lot of soccer and cricket. Um, and I just couldn't fix it. My, um, you know, the, the conventional ways and my journey began with, um, you know, jumping on, you know, the Reddit forums at the time and, um, got chat, chatting to Luis Villasenor on, on there, the keto gains guy and, um, then moved across to Twitter and, um, started to follow that, that ketogenic dieting, um, lifestyle. And, you know, I got some fantastic results and everyone just thought we were absolutely crazy at the time. And, you know, but we had this amazing online community and we shared studies. We looked at, you know, both pros and cons of carbs at the time and, um, pros and cons of eating a lot of fat and, and all sorts of different sort of critical analysis and, you know, we we just learned so much during a couple of years of of doing um, that kind of dis- those kind of discussions on on Reddit and, and and Twitter at the time. So, you know, that was that was all very fascinating. Got the aesthetic results I wanted. Trained like Luis was was saying I should train. I ate like you know people like Marty Kendall, Ted Naiman, and and Luis said I should eat, and um, it all worked really well for me. So I thought, you know, there's there's other areas of my life I want to improve upon. And, you know, I didn't really know what I needed to improve on until I started to hear Bill Lagacos um, talking a lot about circadian rhythms and um, Menno Henselman's as well at the time was talking a lot about circadian rhythms. And I remember listening to a podcast he was on where he was talking about, you know, how the time of day that you could train 
would impact your gains or your fat loss. And Bill Lagacos was talking about when you eat your calories determines how you partition those calories, those macronutrients, um, you know, whether you eat them in the morning or the evening is it, they're digested and metabolized differently. Um, so I started to dive a bit deeper into circadian rhythms and it, it, I came across how they could be impacted and entrained by light and how they can really damage your sleep. And that was when I had that eureka moment where I was like, wow, I need to improve my sleep ever since I was 14. I just hadn't slept well. Um, you know, I, I could get to sleep. Um, but I would wake up continually in the night and I didn't know what it was. And, you know, I thought maybe it was too much protein I was eating. Um, you know, maybe it was stress, et cetera. But it turned out that when I looked into the literature, it was, you know, artificial blue light that was that was causing this. And we can go into, you know, a lot more detail later as, as to why. Um, but I'll keep it sort of high level just just for this intro. But um, I decided to read more and more on circadian rhythms and artificial light. And I found that there was a very distinct zone of light, um, which was between 400 and 550 nanometers, very clear in, in a lot of the academic literature that this zone disrupted sleep hormone melatonin when exposed to after sunset. And um, the way to remedy this was to utilize blue light blocking glasses. So this was when I thought, right, I'm going to do a bit of an N equals one, grab a few pairs of you know, these amber lens sort of safety goggle things from Amazon, pop them on and see how my sleep improves. And lo and behold, when I did this, my sleep improved a little bit. And it still wasn't, you know, the best I, I believe it could have been, but it, it, it improved. And where things really changed up for me in terms of um, learning a lot more about, um, you know, blocking the this specific range of light was when I thought to myself, right, I I actually know people in, in an optics lab here in, in Australia and, you know, they've got all this fancy equipment. They could tell me what percentage of, of the light this was actually blocking. And I took these glasses to them and, and said, can you can you test them? And they did. And they came back with the spectral analysis results. And every single pair of these glasses, I, I had about 20 at this point, um, all different values. Not one of them actually blocked 100 percent in line with what the academic literature was saying you needed to block after sunset to get better wow. sleep. So. Yeah, this is when I said to them, you know, just a crazy idea here, but could you create a tint for me that blocks 100% from 400 to 550 nanometers? And they said, yeah, we, we can do that. Don't know why you want that kind of thing. You know, it looked to me a bit strange. <laughs> they did it. Um, we had a few pairs drawn up. We sent them out to people in the um, health and wellness industry that were already wearing blue light glasses that were already talking about them. And we said to these people, you know, here's the science. We sent them all that. Um, here's a pair of this, these glasses we're thinking about releasing. Um, here's why we think, you know, you, what you're wearing at the moment isn't really optimal for yourselves. Um, you know, all we want is your feedback. You know, we don't care if you promote them or whatever. Just just give us your feedback. And, you know, we sent out, I think, maybe about 25, 30 pairs of these glasses. And every single one of these sort of top people in health and wellness came back to us and just said, yeah, this is this is game changing. You need to start a company. And that was how Blue Blocks was formed. And we started with the Sleep Plus lens to help with um, to help with sleep, um, which blocked 100 percent in that range that I was just talking about. And then that led us to look at light during the day and that you needed to filter it, not block it. And there were specific frequencies you needed to filter during the day. So we created daytime lenses. Then we looked into color therapy and combining that with blue light um blocking um specific frequencies for during the day to help people with sensitivities to light migraines um, anxiety depression etc and that's what sort of led us here to be talking today i think um i think that's probably it in a nutshell yeah very cool it's awesome how how the journey has evolved and how you've continuously innovated and found more ways to help people and not been satisfied with just creating an, another copycat product but really focusing on quality and solving yes. the biggest issues um, I have so many questions, uh, but I guess um, one you you answered with regards to the spectro spectrometry. Um, yes, know, that's the wrong word. But but <laughs> measuring the effectiveness of glasses, how how would someone know if their blue light blocking glasses are working or not? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question, and um, I've actually got a I wrote a blog about six weeks ago on the subject, and it's now number one in Google in in your country. So. Um, if people Google how to test blue light glasses, they'll see an article from me to, to be able to test them. So 
there's a few ways you can do it. OK, like because spectrometers are about ten thousand dollars to buy and we don't even own one. We we utilize, you know, the, the, the lab equipment and luckily we can just build it whenever whenever we want. So no one's going to have access to this bit of kit. So the first thing to do is, you know, there's, there's a there's a there's a color strip test and a, and a circle test on this blog that I've written where it's got two um, strips of color. Um, with all the all the different colors, um, visible colors of light on it. Um, and it's got one underneath that what your what that color line should look like when you wear a pair of blue light blocking glasses that block between 400 and 550 nanometers. They look very different when you haven't got your blue light blocking glasses on. But when you put your blue light blocking glasses on and look at those two lines, they should then appear identical. And if they don't, then your glasses are not effective enough to help induce the optimal amount of melatonin secretion after sunset. So the the issue you've got with a lot of blue light um, glasses at the moment is because it's it's much like keto was a few years ago. It trends, you know, like these. I'm not saying keto is a trend or carnival, but these things do trend. People hear about it more and people want to look into it more that perhaps don't know much about it. Um and on the back of trends, you see companies pop up that have no regard to how the um, the product that they're creating works and the science behind it. Like some examples, like, you know, you can go out and and buy something if you're a piece of food, that if you're following the keto diet that's full of soy, full of hydrogenated vegetable oils. But because it's low in carbs or has no carbs, it's considered keto. But the science behind that is flawed. And the same is true for these companies that are popping up trying to sell blue light glasses. They give you clear lenses and say, yeah, these block blue light. You can wear these after sunset. You don't need to bother with the ugly, you know, orange red lenses. But when you look at, um, you know, the physics of light, you know, you can't have a clear lens that that blocks 100 percent in the spectrum that you need to be blocking, which is all blue and most of the green light. Um, So people you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so people just need to be aware that in order to get optimal sleep after sunset, it has to be this deep orange red lens. There's no way around it. OK, um, you can't wear a yellow lens. You can't wear a clear lens. Those two are great for reducing light during the day when you want to combat digital eye strain or headaches and things like that. But after sunset, you have to be blocking 100 percent in that range. Think of your ancestors sat around a campfire, it's oranges, reds and and yellow lights. There's no greens, there's no blues. So that's you know, the best way to, to, to test it is to look at that blog and, you know, look at the two um, the two lines um, that should appear the same when you wear your blue light glasses. If they don't, then you're wasting the money. And, you know, I can save people a lot of bother that, um, you know, there's maybe two, maybe three companies in the world that actually block the specific amounts of light that you're supposed to be blocking um there's there's blue blocks obviously that that do it and then there's two others that actually block too much um light so you're going to you're going to struggle to to see you're not going to have a good quality of viewing experience watching netflix of of an evening um Mm -hmm. and it's just unnecessary to um to actually block um too much light you know sitting in complete darkness isn't even um isn't even good if you're unwinding before bed it's good when you sleep but not when you're unwinding of an evening so you know that's the best way to do it and you can also if you're going to buy blue light glasses and you know this isn't um you know i never come on these podcasts to sales pitch blue blocks i just come on to educate and give the information and the science you know if you choose to buy from another company what i suggest people do is that before you commit to purchasing is ask for their spectrum test results and if it's not 100 percent blocking between 400 and 550 nanometers then you know not to buy and to save your money um and any reputable company out there will have lens test reports to be able to send you um, and even if they don't block 100 percent in that 400 to 550 nanometer range, they should still be able to produce a test result because, you know, by I don't think it's by law. But, you know, when you actually go to manufacture blue light glasses, whether it's, you know, like our competitors over in a factory in China or in an optics lab here in Australia, like us, they should still have the spectrum test results to be able to tell you how much light's being filtered, how much light's being blocked. So that's always a good Um, tactic to do if you're going out to actually buy a pair of blue light blocking glasses. This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore. Optimal Carnivore was created by carnivores for carnivores. 
They've recently released a new product, a grass-fed bone marrow. It is the whole bone extract, which includes the bone marrow, the cartilage, and collagen peptides. Our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal, including bones, and especially the marrow. All the nutrients and substance that your body needs to build, repair, and maintain your bones, teeth, and connective tissue can come from the bone marrow. It's a complex that contains the same components as home-cooked bone broth, but making bone broth can be a hassle. You have to source high-quality bones, boil them for days, and this is a simple, convenient alternative that's gently freeze-dried so it preserves all the nutrients completely intact. It's perfect for people who are traveling or don't have time to make bone broth themselves. Visit www.amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code carnivore10 to receive 10% off your purchase. Andy, how do you, how long before bed is optimal to block blue light? I've heard different things um, from, from different people. Some say, you know, block it when the sun goes down. You know, I'm here in Boston in the middle of the summer. The sun doesn't go down until basically right before I go to bed. Um, I've heard other mm-hmm. people say it needs to be three hours, two hours, one hour. I remember um, Seamland, um, if you're familiar with his biohacking yeah. show, he he told me one hour is is all you need. Um, but curious to hear, you know, how you think about um, how long you need to block blue light before bed, um, assuming you you will be under artificial light. Yeah, absolutely. And as as you know, it's it's a very very open question um because it it depends on a lot of factors and a lot of context um and you know you and touched upon it then like one, seasonality one more question on that yeah. um i'll add in is is it also a fact is it more a factor of time times intensity of the blue light or does just one temporary exposure destroy your melatonin so you know if you if you take off your glasses for a minute for someone to take a picture of you or yeah. if you take your glasses down so you can see something on the tv screen when you're in the middle of a movie but put them right back on does that destroy your melatonin or is it more a factor of time times in- intensity uh, yeah no, that's, that's another sorry question. sorry to interrupt question. No, that's a great question. Um, and I'll answer that one second. Um, cause it's quite a, quite a, quite a straightforward answer. Um, but going back to your original question, yeah, it, it, it depends on a lot of things. It, it depends on seasonality. Um, it depends on, you know, whether you have daylight savings in your, in your region. Um, it depends on your own ancestry. Um, whether you evolved ancestrally at higher latitudes, but you now live at lower latitudes. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that go into it and it's, it's super complex. But if we keep it sort of fairly high level, I think there's some general rules of thumb that you can look at and you can look at it from a, an, an ancestral standpoint, um, which I typically look at it from, or you can deviate slightly like seam land does and look at it from a biohacking perspective because th- those two sort of areas are very different ancestral is more we want to mimic what our ancestors um lived under whereas biohacking is taking principles of how we lived um ancestrally but obviously optimizing them for our um you know for our own biology and the science that we now know so both um areas are are fascinating and you know i typically lean towards more the ancestral side but i'm heavily involved in biohacking so there's no right or wrong both um have great results and it really depends on the individual as well so we always say you know try both approaches the, the two approaches I'll, I'll mention in a minute and see what works best for you and track your sleep use aura ring use um fitness trackers and things to track your deep sleep so you know what works for you so when it comes to blue light from an ancestral point of view if you think about how your ancestors would have lived they would have got up with the rising sun they would have hunted maybe in the mornings when it was cooler um during the height of the day they would have you know um probably not have hunted as much they would have sought the shade and in the evening the sun would have set and they would have lit a campfire and chilled out before going to sleep you know we can assume that that was you know probably the 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 standard daily practice so from that perspective, as soon as the sun has set and the, you know, the artificial lights around you start coming on, I would start putting on blue light glasses. And, and the reason I would do that, you know, obviously from what I've just explained ancestrally is that our circadian rhythm is, is governed by light signals. And by that, I mean that during specific points of, of the day, 
um, light from the sun changes and it sends different messages to the uh, to, to the central clock system, which is uh, located in, in the super charismatic nucleus. And it sends messages to say, suppress this hormone, release this hormone, suppress this neurotransmitter, release this neurotransmitter. For instance, during the day, sunlight increases cortisol, um, produces more dopamine and, and serotonin. Um, darkness, so the absence of blue and green light, reduces cortisol and increases melatonin. Um, and if you watch the sunset or, you know, you come home and you switch on lights after sunset without blue light glasses on, it's going to trigger a message in that same um, clock system to say, oh, it's daytime, increase cortisol, we don't need to produce melatonin. So for that reason, I typically do not want my eye seeing any artificial blue light once the sun has set. So that's why I, I typically say to people, as soon as that sun sets, those glasses need to go on. Now, the difficulty arises with daylight savings. And if you live in high latitudes, it doesn't get dark until maybe nine, ten o'clock at night, which becomes an issue. Um, but when you look at sleep um, in the literature, um, it's quite clear that sleep is seasonal. So you should be getting a lot less sleep in the summer. Um, you don't need as much. You've got more sunlight, um, which can help with, um, you know, like mitochondrial function. Um, and optimizing its function. But you also need more sleep in the winter. So it might be that, you know, you go to bed later, maybe midnight in the um, uh, in, in the summer months in higher latitude. So you'd wear your blue light glasses, you know, from 10 o'clock till midnight. Then you'd go to sleep and you'd wake up earlier, maybe get five, six hours sleep. And then in the winter, because of the, um, the darkness, um, you would go to sleep earlier and you would wake up later. So you might be getting nine, 10, 11 hours sleep um, because there's not as much sunlight present. Um, and there's, you know, you need more sleep for growth and, and repair during those winter months anyway, when you when you dive into the, the studies. So this is why it's sort of not not really a black and white answer. And, yeah, you know, when you look at it from a biohacking perspective, um, you know, a couple of hours before you want to go to bed could be optimal as well. Um but you've also got to factor in things like meal timing with with that as well. Like you don't want to be eating after sunset if you can help it as well. And, you know, someone like Seam Land probably wouldn't um, eat after sunset. He'd probably train from a circadian standpoint, um, you know, so he's completely optimized what works for him. If I put my blue light glasses on an hour before bed and I've done it and tried it, it doesn't work for me. Um, I wake up in the night still. It, it has no um, no positive effect on me, but it works extremely well for him. So I would suggest starting with, you know, because because these glasses do take a little bit of getting used to. So I would say start with an hour or two before bed um, and see how that works and then maybe work back from there and, and, and experiment. So that's probably where I would land with that. So in answer to your second question, which was if you're wearing them, popping them on after sunset and then you're taking them off throughout the evening, what does that do? So. What it does, and, and Alexander Wunsch is um, one of the leading light experts in the world, and he's been researching circadian rhythms in relation to light for at least sort of 10, 15 years. Um, and he's recently said um, or answered that, that very question and, you know, from from his studies that if you remove your blue light glasses um, to have a photo, like you said, or, you know, have a look at a movie that you're watching, melatonin secretion will completely drop to to zero. And then what will happen is once you put your blue light glasses back on within about 20 minutes, melatonin production will resume at optimal levels again. However, if you continue to do that throughout the night, you could induce something called phase shifting. And phase shifting is that your circadian rhythm shifts um, what time it actually thinks it is in relation to physical time. So, for instance, if you keep taking it on and off three or four times within a night, um, your body, it might be nine o'clock at night, but your body will think it's 11 o'clock at night. So you'll release melatonin earlier um, or later than you should do um, from an optimal biohacking um, biological standpoint, which will then um, impact the time you wake up in the morning. It will impact the cortisol awakening response. Um, it will impact all other hormones. So in the long run, and if you do it frequently, you're going to really impact and damage your circadian rhythm. So if you do it maybe once in a night, that's fine. But if you're doing it more more than that and then every night, then you're going to have um, problems with your circadian rhythm. And this is why 
we also invented a, a flicker free um, low EMF light bulb recently. And it's, it was launched a few weeks ago because my um, my wife had this very problem. She'd wear her blue blocking glasses um, after sunset, but then need to take her makeup off before bed. Um, but she could she had to take her blue light glasses off to do that mm. and have a light on. So that's why we thought, well, we need circadian lighting and we need flicker free lighting. Um, and that's why we, we created the Lumi light bulb so she could have that in um the bathroom um, and we have it everywhere now in our house so that when she takes her blue light glasses off to take her makeup off she doesn't need to disrupt her circadian rhythms because red light has no impact on melatonin production very cool thank you that's super helpful yeah i've stuck to the three hours before bed rule um yes for for how i've worn blue blocking glasses for the last few years but but really helpful to get your additional perspective on on um circadian rhythm sunlight and and the like and um that kind of brings me to one of my other questions which is around amber bulbs and red light bulbs how do you know if those are legit as well because i feel like a lot of them are sold on amazon these these baby night nighttime lights um and i bought a few different brands but how do you know if if they work um and if they're not producing blue light that destroys your melatonin yeah that one's a little bit more difficult um we have tried to knock down the barriers to that by providing spectral analysis reports on our light bulbs so you can you can go online and, and look at the Lumi light bulb from our website and and see the spectral analysis result. So that's the the easiest way. But obviously, people that are producing those types of light bulbs typically have no idea what a nanometer is or a wavelength or a, a biophoton. So um, getting a spectrum report for a bulb is going to prove difficult. Um, and it is um, a tough one because, you know, when you talk to people in the industry that look at light, um, Brian Hoyer being one of them, who's, who's a building biologist, um, and works with, um, lights that flicker, um, and also, you know, artificial blue light as, as well. His sort of analysis on things is that, you know, a lot of these red light bulbs and amber light bulbs that are out there actually contain, still contain quite a lot of blue light. It's just more so in the red range and the amber range, but blue light is still present. Whereas for optimal, um, you know, post sunset melatonin production and, and not to disrupt it, you need like a hundred percent amber or, or red light. Um, because when you spectral analysis, um, test, um, a, you know, firelight, like a candlelight, it's completely devoid of blue and green light. There's a tiny bit of yellow, high in amber and, and absolutely monstrous amounts of red light. So you want to mimic that. And, you know, it's all very well if the light bulb gives out a red color. Um, but if it still contains frequencies of blue light, your eyes can still um, phototransduct that blue light um, into the central clock system and it can still disrupt your your circadian rhythm. But, you know, aside from that, the major, major issue with with any kind of light bulb that's LED is is the flicker. Flicker um, is is hugely um, detrimental to you know how the eye operates the shutter speed of of your um of your eye can be severely damaged by um by led light and 99.9 percent .9 of them flicker um you know it's all done to to save energy they don't stream out a continual pulse of light um you know it's literally just every you know thousand you know bolts of this light every second coming out of an alternating current um, that's severely damaging your, your central nervous system. It's causing eye strain, headaches, migraines. Um, you know, in the extreme cases, people that have photosensitive epilepsy, um, and, and you don't want to be, you know, exposing yourself to that level of, of flicker. Um, so, you know, it's very important not just to get amber or red light bulbs for after sunset or low blue light bulbs for during the day. You need to make sure they're either one incandescent, which is extremely difficult to do if you're outside of the US. Um, they're illegal in Europe um, and Australia. Um, but you also need to look at some of these other options um, that are out there, which are few and far between. Hence why we, we invented one, which is zero flicker light bulbs as well, um, because you want to be avoiding that. You know, light isn't just a story of color. It's a story of how it's delivered through your eyes as well. Got it. That's really helpful. Um, and one question I've always had about blue light blocking that no one's been able to concretely answer for me is why 
and, and maybe it's a, a simplistic question, but why not just take melatonin? Why do we need to produce our own? Um, you know, people all over the U.S. are taking melatonin to help them fall asleep. Um, I take it off and on. But but why do we need to make sure that we wear these blue blocking glasses and um, are producing our own melatonin? Why don't why can't we just take a pill uh, and get it that way? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, going back to sort of the keto side of things, people would look at sort of type two diabetes, uh, diabetics and, and say to them, you know, like, why not just stop eating carbs and <laughs> inject yourself with a hormone? Or, you know, why did you eat so many carbs and, um, jack your insulin levels up and become resistant? And I think the same sure. is true for, for melatonin. And, you know, there's a few studies out there that, um, uh, that have shown some of the detrimental impacts of supplementing on melatonin, but there isn't enough out there that show the long term effects. So you can only really hypothesize um, in, in this instance, because a lot of the study work done on melatonin supplementation has only been short term. Um, and we need to find out a lot more about the long term impacts. And I'm always loathe to supplement on a hormone. Um, you're ultimately engaging in hormone replacement um, therapy and your body has a huge capability to produce um, the optimal amounts of melatonin it needs under the right light environment. So why take it, um, you know, exogenously? The issue you've got with melatonin um, supplementation from a scientific standpoint is that melatonin is produced from the synthesis of tryptophan and serotonin. And it can only be produced in the absence of blue and green light between 400 and 550 nanometers. So if you are taking melatonin sitting under artificial light after sunset, you can see where there's going to be problems here. You're not creating the right and correct um, biological environment to have that hormone produced. Your hor- that hormone cannot be produced um, in optimal levels in the presence of blue and green light. And another factor as well is everyone's different with the amount of melatonin they can secrete. Um, so if you're taking um, melatonin pills, how do you know what the effective dose is or what too much is? Um, you know, it's it's very much like, um, you know, relying on guesswork in order to calculate how much of a specific hormone you should take. You know, you're not going supplementing on steroids um for instance um because you want to get that testosterone boost to gain more muscle you know we all know the detrimental effects of that and um i think that you know there are instances where melatonin supplementation is is going to be okay i think the elderly um because circadian rhythms impair with age and i think that if you're um trying to combat jet lag i think it can be it can be advantageous um but i wouldn't recommend it long term one study that did come out, albeit it was in our furry little cousins, the, the rat, um, they gave rats um, melatonin um, to supplement on um, for long periods of time. And they found that it thinned the retina um, in the um, in, in these little subjects. But obviously, a, a, a mouse study is, is fantastic when it um, when it reaffirms your own beliefs and it's just a mouse study when it doesn't. So you've got to take those with a, with a pinch of salt, but yeah, I I wouldn't be messing around with it when your body has the capability to produce as much melatonin as it needs naturally by wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses. And, you know, when you look at the cost of melatonin supplementation through your whole life and weigh it up to a pair of a hundred dollar blue light glasses that effectively produce as much melatonin, you know, you can either do it from a health perspective that you're not supplementing um, on pills um, and lining big farmers pockets um, and potentially damaging your health. But if you're a financial guy, look at the cost of, you know, 50 years worth of, of melatonin supplements um, versus sure. one pair of hundred dollar blue light glasses. Yeah, I, I really like that, Andy, and I appreciate you saying, uh, being completely intellectually honest where, where the science isn't completely there yet on the long term, um, health effects of, of melatonin, uh, or chronic melatonin use, but I completely agree with your logic, um, around not knowing exactly how much our body is able to produce and, and, um, other, looking at other hormones as well. Um, and I wanted to ask you about a few other products 
um, around blue light blocking that I'm really interested in um, and haven't seen created yet, <laughs> at least not effectively, yeah. um, and curious to hear if it's something that you've thought about. And if you don't want to admit it or if it's something you have in the works that's top secret, feel free to defer. Um, so one is, you know, a, re- a red light refrigerator light. Um, I feel like that's one of the biggest areas of blue light exposure. You know, people probably shouldn't be eating after dark for circadian rhythms, as you said before, but you know, some people need to get into their fridge, um, for other reasons to get water out, sparkling water, whatever to, to prep food for the next morning. Um, have you thought about a red light refrigerator light that you could put in? Yeah, it's, it's a great, um, a great question because, um, they, they, they do exist in the US. Um, oh, really? And yes, they do. There's, there's a guy that, um, uh, called Tim Pagan who, um, a guy that just sort of follows my work. He's really into biohacking light and, um, he sent me, um, pictures of, of his fridge light and he's biohacked it, um, red. So I didn't ask him where he got it, but I, That's awesome. I'm pretty sure it was like, um, just a random, you know, Home Depot, somewhere like that, um, in, in, in the US. So someone has actually got one. I, I, I'd imagine it's probably still a flickering light, but you know, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too, um, too concerned about that given, you know, uh, unless you've got a, a serious problem, you're not sort of staring in a fridge for too long. It's yeah. just a quick, um, you know, open it and pull something out. But yeah. you know, it's a really good point you've made as well, Scott, that, you know, just for me to elaborate on, a lot of people seem to think that, and again, from misinformation that blue lights only present in digital devices, you know, like your laptop, right. your monitor. It's just phone. coming from your phone or your tablet. Yeah. And they go like the amount of people that say, oh, I've got flux or I've got night shift mode on my phone. Like I don't need blue light glasses. It's like, oh, cool. Well, can you let me know when they create an app for your house lights or your TV or your fridge light or your, sh- your car headlights or the, your neighbor's um, house lights or your office lights or your um, modem um LED um, blinking lights or your burglar alarm or your dishwasher, you know, the list goes on. It's everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, I just wanted to. Um, yeah, that, that just got me thinking then that so many people are just like, yeah, I've got flux, got got night shift mode, which, by the way, night shift mode doesn't block blue lights. It just filters it. So it's only good yeah. during the day, ironically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. And another thing I've thought about is. Why aren't there any, and maybe you know this because you've had to actually source the material, but why aren't there any companies that sell like a blue light film that you could cut and put over your computer screen or over your TV yourself? Like if I just wanted to buy a square meter of blue light blocking material, why can't I do that? Yeah. It exists. It does exist. Okay. Um, but um, it the, the problem you've got with that is that – Light isn't a constant throughout the day. You need to change um, different frequencies of light throughout the day to be optimal. So if you have like a a film that blocks all blue light coming out from 400 to 550 nanometers, that's not going to be great during the day. You know, you need some blue light during the day to to be optimal, Um, ideally from the sun. But, you know, if you're in an office and everything's red lights, everything's... um, you know, there's, there's zero blue light, you know, you're going to really wreck your circadian rhythms as well. So you've got to be very careful. And this is why software like Flux and Iris can be OK for blue light management, because you can like Flux, for instance, you can have changing the amount of blue light that comes out of your monitor throughout the day um, based on the time zone you're on. So that can be quite useful. The only issue with Flux is it, it doesn't address flicker from your monitor um whereas iris does have some um credibility in actually reducing flicker so i typically sway towards iris to 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 reduce my blue light in my monitor um and also um, reduce flicker yeah that's great um and how about um a red light alarm clock um, so what I do when I wake up in the middle of the night and, and want to check is I just have my watch, um, and I, I just look at it, but it's very dim. Of course, it's not a, it's not a digital watch. It's an analog. Um, but yeah. I always thought it'd be great to have, you know, an amber light or very soft alarm clock that I could look at to check, check the time, um, in the middle of the night. Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Um, you would want someone to create an alarm clock that, um, emits very low amounts, if any, um, non-native EMF. Mm, um, right. I personally wouldn't want to be sleeping near, um, a, a switched on alternating current, um, because of dirty electric. 
Um, but, you know, if you could have a DC electric current, maybe maybe a battery powered one that emitted only red light, that could be good. Um, the issue you'd have with um, from it from it from a biohacking perspective is that it's quite clear that when you look at it from that perspective, that the most optimal sleep um, occurs in a 100 percent dark environment. Um, and, you know, even with some red light in there, that could could interfere with um, with, with your sleep. It wouldn't interfere with melatonin uh, per se, but it could interfere with with the quality of sleep you get as well. But sure. again, I think that, yeah, if you could get maybe a dim red light one that ran off a DC current, it could be a good a good thing to have. Yeah. And have you thought about blue light blocking clip ons? I have a pair I got from Amazon. It's probably um, one of the terrible brands that don't really work. But uh, <laughs> curious if you've thought about those. I know you offer prescription options, but just for folks who want to be able to easily put the red light on and off of, of their existing lenses. Yeah, absolutely. We we did clip ons for um for about a year. Oh, OK. They, they, they they did sell well, but then we moved into working um, on doing actual prescription glasses for, with all of our different lenses. Um, and they are very useful. Um, we found a lot of people really did like them, but a few people reported that it scratched their lenses, putting them on, mm. um, which which was a bit of a, an annoyance for, for, for everyone involved. Um, and also for us right now and, and for the past sort of 18 months it, it's it's more brand image for us um we wanted to create something that was ultra fashionable as well as backed by science and yeah. we just found that the clip-ons weren't and it wasn't giving us that perception in the market that you know blue box is super stylish because you know these people were posting pictures with their clip-ons on and it didn't fit sure. that side of yeah. things so i'll be completely honest with that but yeah you, you can get them um, if people wanted to, to go out and look for them, they, they are around um, and, and they are somewhat useful. But, you know, I always say to people, ask yourself, you know, do you want to add that extra weight to your glasses when you can just get a, you know, an ultra sleek, stylish pair of of blue blocks that, um, you know, does exactly what it says and, and can even be, you know, we even have the service where people can send us their glasses and we'll pop their lenses out and put our lenses in. Um, and that can be prescription as well. So even if they've got a favorite frame, they can send to us and we'll uh, we'll work on it and make them circadianly optimal for them. Got it. Got it. Um, that's great. And um, what else? This is awesome, Andy, because I talk about sleep on so many of my shows and I'm obsessed with sleep. It's really great to get an expert who has dug deep into the science and also knows some of the technology around ways to improve sleep. What else can we do to optimize our circadian rhythms besides blocking blue light? Um, I, I know I'm opening a huge bag of worms here, but maybe <laughs> if you could just give some of like the top three practical tips for folks um, and then we can always provide more resources. Yeah, absolutely. So what we've got to remember is that um, we as a species have evolved over you know hundreds of thousands maybe millions of years um to you know un under specific environmental conditions so by that i mean that we've evolved outside okay and where we've evolved under something you know a big ball of light called called the sun um and it just so happens that every well, almost every species on on the planet plants and animals have a circadian rhythm that has been created through evolution underneath the sun. And this circadian rhythm, you know, it's, it's Latin circa and dian um, day. So, you know, it's um, circa is about dian is day. Um, it runs for 24 hours and it is governed nine times out of 10 by, by light. So in order to, and then what we've done is, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years since the, the invention of LED lights, we now have this ancient circadian rhythm that's been tied to sunlight cycles. Um, and we're now living under under a perpetual solar noon because that's the same sort of frequencies of light that are given out um, color temperature wise from LEDs. Um, so we're living with an ancient circadian system in a alien 
artificially lit world. And, you know, that's been really detrimental to a lot of, you know, hormonal related issues, you know, like blue light can independently increase blood glucose levels, insulin levels, um, you know, just just by having it shined on you at the wrong wrong time of day, for instance. So, you know, it really impacts your hormones um, you know, at that endocrine level. So what we need to do. So tip number one is that we need to make sure that our circadian rhythms um, and the main gateway to our circadian rhythms is through our skin and through our eyes are exposed to the correct light that we've evolved under. So sunlight. So watching the sunrise in the morning is tip number one. OK, so if you roll over and look at your smartphone or switch your house light on first thing in the morning, you're going to start your body clock ticking at solar noon um, and you're going to miss out on all the hormonal benefits you would have got by watching the sunrise and in training your circadian rhythm at the correct time of day. You know, your serotonin, your dopamine, your cortisol levels um, all need to be higher at that sort of initial point in the day. So watching the sunrise is key to sleeping better later on in the day. Um, and the reason being or well, the main reason being is, number one, you're in training your circadian rhythm correctly. But two, you're going to produce more serotonin. And as I mentioned earlier, serotonin mixes with tryptophan to produce melatonin in the absence of blue light later on in the evening. Um, if people can do it, regular sun breaks throughout the day. So, you know, this is coupled with your filtration of blue light during the day or your blocking of blue light after sunset. Get outside in the morning, eat your lunch outside. Um, go out in the afternoon just for a few minutes to allow your eyes to see the light at that those specific times of day. So your body clock knows what the correct time of day is. They know then what hormones to release and what to suppress. And it will later lead to better sleep. And another tip to use as well um, for better sleep circadianly is not to eat your calories like big, big amounts of calories after sunset. Um, number one, um, the literature has shown that you're more likely to store those calories as as fat um, if you eat them under blue light in an evening, as opposed to when you eat them first thing in the morning. So there's an old adage that I always swear by, which is eat dinner like um, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper. Yeah. Um, and Mar Marty Kendall in, 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 in the nutrition side of things is is has blogged on this recently and, and agrees with the science behind it. So. You know, digestion seems to um, impair melatonin production, which makes sense because melatonin starts from serotonin, which is found in the gut um, and obviously tryptophan as, as well. But what we've also got to remember is that um, specific macronutrients, um, according to some studies out there, and it's been reaffirmed by um, Chris Masterjohn, can actually um, cause awakening response in uh, in humans. And, you know, protein and, and fats are, are two of those um, macronutrients, which is pretty, um, you know, relevant to your audience that actually cause awakening response. So you want to be eating those calories at the beginning of the day um, and not after sunset. You know, if you want to eat something after sunset, um, simple sugars seem to be the, the best thing to eat. You know, like um, people swear by glycine. Um, you know, you can also, you know, eat a banana, pieces of fruit or something like that if you need to eat before bed, um, as it doesn't seem to cause an awakening response um, from a circadian standpoint. So typically I'll eat my calories um, well after the cortisol awakening response. So round about sort of three to four hours after waking up. I'll eat the majority of my calories um, and then typically have another meal about sort of three or four o'clock um, in the afternoon. And then I'll fast all the way through then from, um, say, four or five o'clock in the evening all the way through to about, you know, 11 o'clock, um, 11 a.m. the next day. So, you know, intermittent fasting is a huge thing, but people just do it wrong. Um, a lot yeah. of people you know, get up and fast in the mornings, then slam a load of calories before bed. But, you know, might be good for a bit of weight loss in the um, and, you know, autophagy and ap apoptosis in the in the short term. But in the long term, you're going to damage your circadian rhythm, which will disrupt your sleep and lack of sleep leads to um, weight gain later on in life as well. So just flip it over um, and do your IF, um, you know, in the evenings.
Absolutely. That's something I've been advocating for years now. And I think I originally learned it from um, Tristan Haggard of Primal Edge Health. Mm -hmm. Um, He talks a lot about that. Yes. And uh, man, it's crazy the amount of people I have coming to me saying, you know, I don't know what's going on with my weight. I am eating carnivore. And I say, you know, when do you eat your meals? What do your meals look like? And they'll say, you know, I have a pound of meat and some eggs for lunch, and then I'll have a pound and a half, two pounds of meat for dinner with eggs and cheese and butter. Mm. And I'm saying there is no way you're even close to digesting that meal. If you go to bed, you you know, I I heard somewhere it takes um, roughly an hour per 10 to 20 grams of protein um, Mm. to digest a a high protein and fat meal. So if you're eating, you know, a a pound of meat um, or half a kilo for, for folks not on, um, the imperial system, yeah. you know, that's, that's 10 hours right there. So yeah, you, you really need to space it away from, from your, your uh, bedtime. Um, exactly. Sure that's digested. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's another factor in here and I, I spoke about this twice on, um, Vanessa Spinner's, um, podcast ketogenic girl. And, yeah. um, she, um, she and I really spoke in depth about blue lights effect on the hormone cortisol um and it can really wreak havoc on your cortisol's natural cycle um and also elevate cortisol if you're exposed to copious amounts of blue light after sunset um and what does cortisol do when it's elevated you know you you you're more likely to store body fat you're in fight or flight you know you're going to seek out um you know more naughty foods you know high in in fat and, and and sugar but also if you're eating carnivore or keto or any kind of diet under highly stressful conditions, how you partition those macronutrients is going to be very different to if you were very relaxed and calm and Mm. your cortisol levels were lower. So sometimes it can come down to not what you're eating, but like we alluded to when you're eating it, but also what kind of light you're eating under, because you could be having very high blood sugar levels, um, very high cortisol levels by eating calories in the evening under artificial blue light. Um, and then you're still, you know, you might be eating the correct diet, which could be carnivore for you. Um, but you could be spinning your wheels. You know, I'm not losing weight. Why am I not losing weight? I'm eating carnivore. Like everyone says I should be. Um, but if you're not paying attention to the light you're eating it under, you might just be spinning your wheels. And, you know, another thing that sprung to mind then is that, you know, we, we know that, you know, from the research you guys have done that, you know, like a carnivore diet, is is great you know it's it it does well for a lot of people um you know and it's a really good quality diet to follow you're getting a lot of micronutrients etc but with any kind of diet that you're following where um you know you don't know on an n equals one level how you handle that specific diet and i'm this is by no means um discrediting any kind of diet because i think that diet is an individual thing and i think that people do well on you know carnivore keto um balanced diets pescatarian vegan to some extent although it's very rare um you know type of diets but you don't know the long-term effects of those diets and one thing that you can do to mitigate the unknown um is have huge amounts of antioxidants um present in your um in, in your body And the most powerful antioxidant that you can have produced is melatonin. Um, People just think of it as a sleep hormone, but it's it's the only um, antioxidant um, that humans can produce or take. You know, you know, if people take blueberries and it's an antioxidant that actually neutralizes um, reactive oxygen species without itself producing oxygen as a byproduct. So it is literally the purest antioxidant you can have. So if you're putting yourselves under a lot of stress or like I, like I was alluding to, the unknowns of long, long term effects of a specific dietary protocol, I would want to have some sort of safety net in place personally where I have high levels of melatonin in my bloodstream at the correct times of day because melatonin is responsible for huge amounts of apoptosis and autophagy. But it's also one of the most potent neutralizers and scavengers of free radicals and reactive oxygen species in the body. So um, that's another reason why I wouldn't eat after sunset and I would be managing light after sunset to ensure that I've got the adequate levels of that antioxidant in my bloodstream to mitigate the unknown of, of any dietary protocol that I'd be practicing. 
Yeah, that's great. And it, I love how you get back to it's not only what you eat, um, but also how you eat and when you eat. That's really mm-hmm. relevant. Well, Andy, this has been fantastic. I feel like uh, we've just scratched the surface and, and we'll have to do a part two at some point. But um, where can folks find out more about you, what you're doing? And I'll provide links to all of that in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. I think the best place, um, best two places at the moment, which is where my time is major- uh, spent in the majority, is YouTube. Um, we're, we're getting sort of some good traction on there. So I'm doing weekly videos about five to 10 minutes long about a subject in light. Um, you know, from things like what is blue light to, um, you know, how to sleep better to how, you know, other things, how, when to eat, you know, specific calories and, and talking about the science. So that's, that's a good place to, to find us. And, um, it's just blue blocks, um, on, on YouTube. Um, the blog, section on our site blueblocks.com b-l-u-b-l-o-x.com i blog once a week as well um some really complex blogs but also some really easy to understand ones as well um so you can you can filter through those um you know there's probably about a hundred on there at the moment that that people can dive in and have a read of and joining the newsletter as well because i send out the blogs um via that once a week so people can have a read um I will be more active on social media. Facebook is typically where I'm most active, um, but I am super busy with a lot of um, sort of podcasts um, ourselves um, at, at the moment. So I typically go on two or three a week, which takes up a lot of time. Um, and I like to spend my time researching as well. So social media, probably not so much at the moment. But if people want to follow me on Instagram, I am Andy Mant. Um, if they want to listen to our podcast, it's that so yesterday. So we've got some really cool guests. We've had Vanessa Spinner, Seam Land, for instance, um, uh, in the, in the sort of keto, um, carnivore type world on recently. So people can go and check those interviews out. That's tsypodcast.com. That's so yesterday. Um, and that's probably the best places to find us. I mean, you know, Instagram is great. Facebook is just Andy Mant. You'll, you'll find me on there. And the light and health group on Facebook is pretty handy as well um, for for information on on light. So they're, they're probably the best places. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. I'll link to all of that in the show notes. I found your blog super helpful and really enjoyed all the information you put out. And I think listeners will really enjoy this too. So thanks again for your time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Cheers, Scott. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.